Welcome to my lecture online. Again, in order to try and get a handle around all the functional groups that we might encounter in organic chemistry, well, let's try to lay it out in another simplified form. Now notice we're going to have three main groups, but the top group, the not functional groups, essentially these are what we call the chains that we could possibly have. We can have alkanes with all single bonds, alkene with at least one double bond, and alkyne with at least a triple bond. So those are the various kinds of organic molecules you can have with strings of carbon atoms and hydrogens that attach to the corners. And then we have the rings. We have phenol and benzyl. They're roughly the same. They're slightly different in structure and we'll get a little bit more into the details of that as well. But then attached to those you can have any one of these functional groups. Now they're divided into two main categories. Notice the one on the bottom, they all have one thing in common. They have an oxygen with a double bond attached to the chain. You don't see that in this group here at all. So let's take a look at this group here first. Of course, we have the alkyl halides, where we have one of the halide atoms attached to a chain of carbons. So this can either be fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine. Then we have the amine group, where we have an NH2 attached to a carbon chain. We have the alcohol group, where we have an OH attached to the chain. And notice there's a slight difference between the alcohol group and the ether. Notice on the ether, we have an OR, so instead of a hydrogen attached to the oxygen at the end of a chain that makes an alcohol, an ether has an oxygen and another string could be anywhere from one to two, three, or as many carbons as you need on the other side. Then we have something we haven't talked about yet, the thiols, which have sulfur instead of oxygen or nitrogen. So we have sulfur and hydrogen. So this looks very much like an alcohol, except instead of an oxygen, we have a sulfur atom. And they have nitrile, which has a nitrogen attached to the final carbon atom in the chain. Going back then to the six that we have over here, where all of them has an oxygen with a double bond to the chain. And notice that the oxygen is somewhere in the middle of the chain, not at the very end of the chain. But in this case, with the aldehydes, it's essentially part of the last carbon because then we have a hydrogen attached to it. So in essence, that when you have an, an aldehyde, you have the oxygen double bond attached to the very last carbon right there in the chain. With a ketone, that's not the case. You'll have carbons on both sides of where the oxygen is attached to this carbon atom right here. So you have a carbon atom, we have two chains of carbons, could be one on each side, could be more than one on each side, doesn't have to be the same. But notice with the ketone, we have an oxygen somewhere in the middle. With an acid halide, notice it's the same as this, but then at the end, so that's kind of the same as where we have an aldehyde here. With an acid halide, we have one of the halide items on the end instead of a hydrogen. With the amides, looks the same as an acid halide or looks the same as an aldehyde, but in that case, we have an NH2 at the very end of the chain. Here we have the carbol carboxylic, I always have trouble pronouncing that word, carboxylic acid. So here we have an OH attached at the end where we have a double bond. So at the last connection right here, instead of a carbon, we have an OH, we have a double bond oxygen. And then over here, so what makes the difference between the acid and the ester, over here instead of having an OH, we have an O with another string, another chain of carbon atoms attached to it. But again, if you can take a look at it like this, it has a certain amount of organizational structure to it, which may help identify which is which. Of course, you still have to memorize it. It takes a lot of effort to do that, and you easily can forget or mix things up. So it does help to spend a little time committing this to memory. But again, if you have this in memory, for example, if you take a blank piece of paper, you could just draw this out without looking at anything. That would be fantastic because then you really have understood the differences between all the various functional groups. So good luck with that. Hope you can do that. Hope you have the time and the energy to do it. So we'll give you some more insight into, of course, the various functional groups and the different categories of groups in the videos to come.